Hi, I'm Hannes. Hello, I'm Dominic. And today we will have Daniele Grattarola presenting his paper, Learning Graph Cellular Automata. And if you want to join these reading group sessions yourself, you will find all of the information in the description. All right, so as I was saying, this is, uh, this is the talk of the last paper that I worked on while, uh, while at ITSIA. So the affiliation is still my old affiliation. Um, and this was a paper that we published at uh, NeurIPS 2021. And as you can probably guess from the title, this is a paper that talks about uh, cellular automata and in particular a general version of that, which uh, is called the graph cellular automata, which you can probably already guess what it is. Um, and in particular, our, our work was to look at this model and, and try and see some uh, parallelism that exists between this, this idea and, and graph neural networks and kind of using uh, graph your neural networks as a, as a sort of learnable uh, engine for, for the transition of this uh, GCA model. Uh, and so this is like the, the short version of the, of the paper. I'm going to go into details, of course. Um, but maybe uh, if somebody maybe doesn't know what a cellular automata is, um, well, they are really, really cool things. They are a sort of computational model uh, that consists of two things. Uh, the first one would be uh, an array or a grid or let's say a 3D Minecraft-like world of cubes um, of cells. So you have these cells arranged in a regular lattice. These cells have a state, typically a binary state, but they can be uh, they can be one of m possible state. They can be a continuous state. And you have this these cells arranged in this regular lattice. And then you have the important thing, which is the transition rule which is a function that gets applied to every cell synchronously uh, and essentially decides the next state of the cell. So by applying the transition rule, we have one time step forward in time. Um, and the interesting thing of this transition rule is that it is a function of the cell itself and of its neighborhood, however you like to define, define it. So in this case, seeing the top figure, we, we, we might have one cell and it's two immediate neighbors. And depending on the configuration of states that we have, we can uh, have a, next, uh, a different uh, next state for the cell. Um, and of course, uh, once, you, once you apply this, this transition rule, a sort of discrete time dynamical system, um, what you have is that interesting uh, patterns emerge just from the local interaction of this transition rule and the cells, local being the keyword. Uh, and so in this image here, we would have uh, an horizontal uh, array of cells and in time kind of goes uh, down, downwards. And so you see these triangles that emerge. And of course we can uh, define different uh, transition tables. And if we change how this transition table is defined, we get um, different kinds of patterns that emerge. Uh, and the ones that we typically are interested in is what Wolfram calls the class four cellular automata or class four rules like this one in the bottom right um, that are the ones that exhibit what I would call the interesting dynamics. Formally, these are described, are defined as dynamics that have a very long transient where interesting and complex things happen. Uh, and then kind of they settle down into periodic behaviors. But so we kind of want to study this, this interesting transient here. And these are all one dimensional cellular automata. And again, time goes downwards, uh, but probably the most famous uh, class four CA that there is out there is something called the game of life, which is a two dimensional automata. So in this case, we don't see time this is just a single snapshot. And this is very, very interesting because the principle is the same. It's, it's a binary CA. The, the rule uh, is still a very local rule. Uh, it is a fairly simple rule. And by applying this rule repeatedly, we get uh, behaviors, we get patterns that form over time. Of course, you should imagine this image is animated right now, uh, and you can find plenty of them on the internet if you look at it, if you look it up. Um, and, and the thing is that even the simple setting like this one already yields some behaviors that we typically associate uh, with living things. And so you would see that these patterns move around and they have a sort of persistence over time and space and they tend to interact with each other. They can spawn other creatures and, and so on and so forth. So a very simple principle that even in, in the simplest possible setting gives rise to very complex or at least interesting phenomena. And again, 
uh, I really want to stress that the, the, the important thing, what distinguishes uh, the cellular automata from any other discrete time dynamical system here is the fact that the update rule is shared and it is local. And, and this is really what makes the definition of cellular automata. So if you really want to pin it down to a single keyword it would be local. And so if you just keep that, uh, that idea fixed, uh, then you can ask the question of what happens if I complicate everything else? So, for instance, if I take the game of life and I and I start to play around with the size and shape of the neighborhood, maybe I uh, increase uh, the resolution a bit, maybe I change the state from binary to continuous. And if you do all of what I just said, uh, essentially what you get is uh, something that is called the Lenya CA, which is one of the possible things you can get if you, if you start complicating the game of life. Um, and in this case, the Lenya CA is, it has a higher resolution, it has a higher shape, uh, it has a bigger neighborhood around each cell, um, and it has a continuous state. And by playing around with how the transition rule is defined, you see that the patterns that we start to get, and all of these are individual patterns that you may find in a Lenya CA, they start to become insanely lifelike and their behavior starts to become intensely complex, meaning that they can, uh, uh, for instance, they can be produced by mitosis or they can uh, combine together to form membranes and then higher order organisms and they have this weird oscillating behaviors that again you should definitely look them up if you don't know about this work it's it's mesmerizing to look at um, and the authors also make this very strong argument i would say with this figure on the right of saying that well if we compare some of the shapes some of the patterns that we see uh, in the Lenya CA and, and we compare them to some fossils or, or algae or very uh, primordial forms of life and cellular life, we see that the similarity is striking, which is less of a statement about the origin of life as much as it is a statement about the underlying mechanism for life. So we know that life itself is something that happens locally. There is no global coordination of the cells in a body. We have uh, cells that learn or, or that naturally, automatically specialize and, and form organisms. And so this is the very same principle. And so you can see how this is fascinating. And again, I want to remind you that uh, the only thing that we did so far is starting from the one dimensional CA that the Wolfram studied, we kept the locality and we made everything else more complicated, right? But there is one thing we haven't complicated yet. And of course, you can probably guess where this is going. Uh, and that is the, the lattice, the, the underlying topology of the cells, right? And, and of course, we know that if the only requirement that we have is locality, then the generalization of that, of course, uh, it is going from the grid, which is a sort of discretization of the Euclidean space, to the graph, which can be seen from a geometrical perspective. You can see it as uh, as any as a discretization of any possible manifold, if you want, or, or any arbitrary geometry. Uh, but uh, you can also see it as changing the idea of locality from spatial to logical or functional. So you just change the meaning of what it what it means to to be a neighbor of a cell. And so what you get is that uh, if, if, you, if you make this step, you, you can get to the most general possible CA, which we call the graph CA or GCA, uh, in which the cells are arranged in an arbitrary graph, of course. Uh, and then for generality, we can think of a continuous state, yes, but also multidimensional, which you could also do for the grid case. But just, just for the sake of argument here, I'm, I'm just going to say that we want to put ourselves in the most general possible setting. So we consider the graph topology. Um, multi-dimensional continuous states. And then of course we can also have discrete as a, as a particular case. Um, and, and of course then the transition rule, the principle is the same. It's just that the transition rule becomes a function of the particular neighborhood around the node. And so we will have that uh, the next state for a particular cell is given of course by the cell itself and, and its neighbors. So however, um, this formulation is not necessarily complete because if we just uh, formulate it like this, uh, then, as you probably know, because <laughs> this is a graph machine learning group, so probably most of the things that I'm saying are already ringing a lot of bells. Uh, but if you look at this like this, this is a, a, a transition rule, which is uh, symmetric or more specifically isotropic, meaning that every neighbor, every neighbor has the same uh, meaning, essentially. For, for, this, for the ego node. Um, and so how do we make that more general so that we can also cover the original case of the grid? For instance, well, we have to make the rule uh, anisotropic and that means that we have to have the ability of treating different neighbors differently. Uh, and you can achieve that by uh, introducing what we call the edge attributes here um, that can be really anything that allow you to identify the neighbors or some property. 
of the neighbors with respect to the center node. Um, and, and that gives you the ability of formulating your transition rule with this rather uh, unorthodox and imprecise notation. But I think that kind of gives us the idea of what we want to do. So the, the next state will be a function of, yes, the state themselves, but also of the kind of relations that exist there. And, and, and you can see how, uh, for instance, by encoding directionality, uh, in, in this attributes, we can already recover the grid case uh, with the with the isotropic rule. So um, you see that uh, with this formalism, essentially, we have really achieved the most general possible formulation for the graph cellular automata, and in general for this for the CA family. Uh, so so now, why all this uh, long premise, uh, and and what really is the paper about? Well. The idea is more or less as follows. So if you look at the literature on, on cellular automata, the, the, let's say the typical one even, they uh, usually are considered as things that are nice to look at. Yeah, they did the nice patterns, that's, that's right, they're, they're pretty, uh, but usually it kind of stops there. Uh, but the fact is that we've already seen that the principle by which this CA models work is, is very natural, is very general. In fact, it is also very powerful because you can prove that some uh, kinds of CA are true incomplete. So they are very powerful computational models, maybe not efficient, but they are definitely expressive. They, you, you can do things with them, right? And so one question that one may ask is, okay, so instead of pretty, can we do useful? Okay. Uh, and so this is the kind of question that drives this, uh, this paper and, and, and the research around, uh, around cellular automata. Uh, and, and of course, the answer to this question is yes, yes, you, you can, of course, if you if you sit down and you design a rule that does something that that that, that you want it to do that 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 solves a particular task, of course, you can you can do this. But designing such a rule may not be easy to do because you have to have a deep understanding of, pro of the problem and of how uh, the local interaction of your uh, of your cells uh, through the emergence of some global property might solve your problem right uh, and, and this is of course very very complicated it has been done but it is complicated and so uh, a different path that we may take is okay let's just specify some high level behavior that we would like the rule to have and then we just learn it all right so that was, this would be the approach and this is not not even a new idea um, because if you look back at the literature on cellular automata and, and machine learning, uh, we can go back to 1992, and this is a Europe's paper, uh, 1992, um, where uh, already they were thinking about whether neural networks could be used to do this kind of approximation, to, do, to, to use them as a learnable uh, form of, of a transition rule for a CA. And what they did here is that they used uh, some product networks, which are, well, not that different from multilayer perceptrons, um, with, with weight sharing, which essentially makes them convolutional neural networks. And, and they showed that, uh, that these kind of models could learn to imitate uh, some given 1D or 2D binary CA. Of course, at the time, everything was, was more simple. But this was, I would say, uh, that this is a seminal uh, paper for this whole field of the neural cellular automata. Uh, and then over time, different people tried different approaches. There, there are these two papers which I chose as representative for the uh, neuroevolutionary kind of approaches, where essentially they still use neural networks, but they search the parameters through evolution. And one thing that they did here, which is very interesting, and I'll talk about that later also, uh, is the task of morphogenesis, which essentially is uh, the task of starting from a random configuration you have to find a rule that uh, lands the SCA uh, into a given arrangement, in this case, the flag of Hungary, and they do a lot of work with flags in these two papers. Um, and so you, you can try and think of a task like that and, and try and find a, a neural network rule that actually does what you want, right? And so this is, this is one possible task, and this is already a form of a rule design to solve a particular problem. However, it may be trivial in this case, but uh, it, it really, tells you how you might want to, to, to look at the problem. And of course, uh, more recently, deep learning revolution and everything, we have uh, convolutional neural networks, not that different in spirit from what they did in 1992, of course, but here we have this very interesting work by Gilpin, uh, William Gilpin, where um, he essentially uh, studied uh, using uh, the convolutional neural network as, uh, as, let's say, as a natural form for uh, a CA transition rule, for, for a 2D CA transition rule, in this case, a game of life. And one thing that they showed in this paper was that uh, if you have a particular 
architecture for a CNN, you can actually set the weights manually. You know how to set the weights manually so that you can implement uh, any arbitrary transition rule. And they show uh, a constructed demonstration of how to do this. I will also pick it up uh, later. And so this was one idea. And even more recently, there's this work uh, by Morgan Seth, which kind of combined all the ideas about before. Um, and, and, and what they did in this paper is that they were inspired by the flatworm, which is this tiny uh, cartoonish creature that as you can see here in the bottom. And, and this animal is fairly interesting because if you cut it in half, uh, it has the ability of re regrowing back into the original thing. And so you can kind of it kind of copies itself back right into the original thing. And, and it does so, of course, through a process which is necessarily local. It is necessarily like what you see with the, with the CA, right? Because there is, again, no centralized controller. The cells are, this is not a sophisticated animal. So the cells are kind of uh, working on their own and, and depending on, on the signals they receive. And it's able to do this kind of global coherent uh, behavior. And so inspired by that, uh, which is essentially, again, a task of morphogenesis, what they did is that they configured uh, a, a convolutional neural network to do the same thing that the platform does, but for arbitrary images, and they focus a lot on emojis, for instance. So you cut the emoji in half and you train this uh, neural network CA to grow it into the original image, or you start from a single pixel and you train it to grow into the whole uh, image. And, and they do this kind of, uh, of experiments, which is really fascinating because you actually see this uh, natural uh, behavior that, that the model learns into for, for growing into the original thing. All right. So at this point, I think I've not, maybe not bored you. I'm sorry? Yeah, can I just interrupt uh, for a second? Oh, yeah, sure. Go to the previous slide. Sure. Um, yeah, so here you're showing different work that, that have shown like that uh, by learning rules, you can try to mimic systems and uh, try, you, you can uh, generate um, like images or converge to a given point. And mm -hmm. uh, just want to say that from my perspective, like when I first saw this kind of behavior, I was very surprised because uh, the cellular automata are known to be very chaotic systems. Yes. So uh, it's extremely difficult, like for any chaotic system, to predict the outcome given a set of initial condition. Um, and the fact that the neural network is able to converge to some point of stability where it can actually find something uh, that converges, to, to me, it's uh, something uh, very impressive. And I, I think is. you'll get into more details later. So. I will absolutely, and I 100% agree that it is fascinating uh, because, so what I find fascinating about this, and of course the work that we have done is that the same rule has to learn to very different things and it has to work in two very different settings. So you have to go from random to order and from order to order. And so it is like, it has to learn to put everything in its place almost immediately, as you can probably as you can probably see here, uh, and 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 then it has to learn to stay there. And this kind of two two modes is is very fascinating. And and yes, I have I have more results, but uh, I totally agree. Uh, although I have to say that not all CAs are chaotic. Most of them are, but the ones that we usually study are uh, are these class four CAs that. Uh, have this exact behavior. So they have a complex strange at the beginning and then they, they kind of settle down. Yeah, so it is in their nature. Those are the ones that we are trying to, to imitate here, right? And the, the ones that yeah. you, uh, the ones where that you use as tests or in your experiments, those are the ones that aren't chaotic. So yeah, for me, exactly. Yeah, no, it, it is, it is, it is right. And so people typically study CA for the transients and don't really care about when they settle down because when they settle down, it's like the universal death. Uh, so people want to look at the patterns and everything uh, just as for the sake of experiments, uh, especially if you don't know how to specify what a pattern is or what, what patterns you would like to see in your CA a priori. So for these experiments, we actually studied the the, the end of the transient. So we want the transient to bring us to a particular state, right? So, which is a, in, a, in a sense, it is a form of controlling the transient. Um, but yeah, it's, uh, it's exactly the kind of things that people uh, have been studying CA for uh, in the past as well, yeah. Okay, but now you're kind of, were making a bit of this point that this is not, not only cool and <laughs> a super nice thing, yeah. <laughs> uh, but that it's also useful. 
And like when I came across this paper the first time, I thought, well, this does not make sense. Uh, new <laughs> cellular or cellular automata. The, the cool thing is that from simple rules, we can get pretty impressive or you have some periodic behavior or mm -hmm. interesting behavior. And now we're saying, yeah, let's replace those, those simple rules by non-simple rules and then be surprised that we still get um, <laughs> interesting behavior. Yeah, it is true. Uh, I would say that there is this tendency to have like simple rules give us good results. Uh, if you want to see really lifelike results, you have to start complicating the rules, which is more or less the point that I was making at the beginning. Um, and, and really the only thing that you want to keep fixed is this idea of the local interaction applied that happens over time, right? Uh, and so, yeah, if you, if you want to control the behavior, it is likely that you will have to make it more complicated. But for instance, one thing that we show also in the paper, I will not talk about it in detail here, uh, but in the paper, for instance, we show that to approximate one of the uh, CAs that we try and do with the experiments, uh, you don't really need a very big network. You can do it with six neurons. And so you can kind of, if you know what you're trying to do, and, and if you know your problem well, which you can do in this, in this experiment that we'll talk about later, then you can also design your, your model to be very simple uh, with the advantage that the architecture is essentially the same. So you have like this universal architecture that, that can implement everything that you want to do with this kind of model. But I totally agree that one of the fascinations of this CA is, is their simplicity in a sense. Um, but then again, you have to design them and then you can explore the simplicity and just simplicity for simplicity's sake doesn't necessarily give you interesting things. In fact, in general, it gives you chaotic behavior. Yeah, but, so, yeah. but that's, that's the, the thing that I'm, that I'm kind of saying that I don't really see the, the usefulness of framing this as a yeah, cellular automata. And but let's first go, go a little bit uh, with your introduction of how the, the GCA or GNCA now really works. Yeah. And then I guess sure. back to my uh, <laughs> my stupid comments. But let's... no, it's fine. It's fine. It's actually a very interesting discussion because it's it's actually a really interesting problem, I think. But yeah, I'll, I'll just go ahead and then we maybe we can have a discussion later. But so uh, so as I was saying, the so the key idea here is, is the locality. And as you probably saw before, the, the definition itself of the, of the transition rule on the graph is, uh, well, essentially a message passing function. So you have a dependency on the state itself, on the state of the neighbors. And if you want to make it even more general, you can also introduce some dependency on, uh, on the edge attributes between, uh, between the neighbors um, and the nodes. And so uh, it kind of, naturally lends itself to this uh, parallelism uh, exactly as it did in the case of the grid with the CNN. This is kind of, again, the generalization of that, uh, where you can make the argument that as the CNN was the natural family of models to do it on the grid, uh, if you move to the graph, of course, you have the same, the same ideas. Uh, and, and you have the GNN as a natural family of models. Um, and so what we study in the paper, well, first of all, we call this, uh, as Hannes was saying, the graph neural cellular automata. Um, and what we propose is this uh, architecture that is not really important to see the details of how you implement it, but uh, what it is important is the overall architecture where essentially you have three blocks, you have uh, a pre-processing multi-layer perception, then a self-message passing and then a post-processing multi-layer perception applied just to the state. Um, and this, one of the claims that we made, actually the first claim that we make, it is a general enough uh, architecture so that it allows you to implement, uh, as Gilpin showed for uh, the grid case, it, it allows you to implement uh, any arbitrary transition rule uh, on uh, for a particular family of GCA, which we call the M state GCA, so where the state set is finite. Um, and by setting the weight smartly, you can implement the same two operations that you need on the grid, which is uh, one-out encoding, and this is done by the multi-layer perception, and then uh, pattern matching, which you can do by using uh, the states and the edge attributes as a sort of key. And then you have as many uh, channels in this neural network as you need uh, to, uh, let's say, in a sense, implement uh, 
every possible combination of the inputs uh, and, and you can then map these combinations, uh, just the ones that match the actual input, you can map them uh, to, to the next state that you want. So you can kind of hand design your, your, your neural network and then you, you just kind of need these two first blocks to do this. Um, but then this gives you a general model that you can do. You, you can set the weights manually uh, but this is, of course, this is useful in a sense, but also not very useful because it doesn't scale really well and it doesn't really tell you much about um, about how you sh uh, what, what what this model can do in in, in practice, right? Um, because again, we want to design the rule and we do not want to be setting the the weights manually or design the rule manually. Uh, we want to learn it. Um, and so, in practice, what we did then experimentally was that we scaled the architecture down, so we reduce, of course, the number of weights. Um, we take some hyperparameters from the literature so that it is like a realistic in a sense configuration. Um, and then we try and see if this architecture can actually learn some of the transition rules that we may find in the wild. So we have three experiments to our experiments of imitation learning to just see that, uh, you know, the hypothesis space contains the actual family that we're trying to approximate. Um, and, and then of course, we also apply it uh, to morphogenesis to actually design a particular rule. So the first experiment we tried was this uh, Boronoi tessellation GCA which is in a sense the simplest possible extension uh, of the game of life to the case of the graph. So instead of a regular grid, you have uh, a Voronoi tessellation. So the graph here would be the delinear triangulation of the cells. Um, and the states, the states again are binary. Um, and now we're trying, I hear you have a question, Hannes? Yeah, yeah. So the Delanoi uh, triangulation, that, that thing is just, then we're putting this arbitrary grids or what these these cells onto uh, onto some two D plane. Uh, yes, essentially you take uh, a, a uniform random points on the plane, and then you you can see it, it. It's the dual problem, one of the other. So you either you compute the the Voronoi tessellation or you just connect the the points into triangles. Yeah, but, but what we're seeing here on on the screen right now, there you're just mm -hmm. throwing some uniform points onto there mm -hmm. and then basically taking like everything that in a KNN or one NN classification, each pixel that would be uh, or each pixel that is closest to to one of yes. the points is then uh, framed by um, a gray line. And then you randomly go ahead and set a few, uh, yeah, do your binary setting where a few are mm -hmm. activated and a few are deactivated. And then what, what exactly is the Voronoi tessellation? Does that now re just refer to constructing this? Or is that then the, does this refer to the, the update rule where we have this, um, where, we, where we look at sure. the number of neighbors that are activated right. or deactivated? So the, the Voronoi tessellation is something that you can construct from a set of points. So the starting condition here is just a set of random points on the plane, all right? Then the Voronoi tessellation is a subdivision of the plane into regions so that a region would be here, a, a little cell here, and every point in the region is the is closest to the, the centroid in a sense, so it's all right? Just another word for this Delonoi, Delonai. The Delonai is the opposite. It's like it's a dual in a sense. Delonai oh. is the graph that describes the which cells are near to each other. Yeah, but now the the GCA that you're describing here, or that we will then turn this into, uh, that just goes ahead and for every boundary that we have here, we have an edge, and for every face that we have here, we will have a vertex. Exactly, exactly. That's exactly the case. And, and of course, you can see this as a, it's, it's a sort of partitioning. If you have perfectly spaced out points, you would get, I guess you would get the grid again, or the grid of pixels. Um, in this case, you have random points, so you get yeah. this random looking thing. And, but yes, the, the, the linear triangulation that gives you the graph uh, that describes the adjacency between cells, yeah. all right? Um, and then again, you can assign, so yes, every cell here would be a vertex and you can assign a state in this case binary and it's assigned randomly, all right? And, and the transition rule uh, does not really, this is just the environment in a sense. The transition rule then acts on this environment and it, is, it, it works like this. So for every node, 
you look at the neighbors and they can be either alive or dead. Uh, and then you count the density. You, you compute the density of alive neighbors around the node. This is what is called another totalistic rule uh, because it doesn't really depend on specific configuration of the neighbors. It's just, uh, let's say, I would say an invariant, uh, an invariant function. Uh, so you, you essentially compute the density and then you have a threshold. And if the, uh, the density is above the threshold, then you switch the state of the, of the cell. Otherwise the state remains the same. Um, and then of course you can play with the threshold. And if you play with the threshold, you get different behaviors again. Uh, and this is very simple, but it's already very interesting to study because you see that as a function of the threshold kappa, uh, you can compute the different measures of entropy. And in this case, we have the blue line is the typical Shannon entropy, and the orange line is what is called the word entropy. And it is a sort of measure of interestingness of the patterns that you see. It is very rude, crude, uh, but uh, it is already uh, something that can give you a sense of, of, of whether interesting things are happening in your dynamics. And so you can see that um, for very low thresholds, uh, essentially, we have total chaos. We have an entropy of 1.0 in, in the Shannon entropy because at every time step, the states are changing. And so this is essentially, you, you, you have a total chaos. Um, but if you have uh, um, a high threshold, then you have total order. And so you see that there is this uh, transition here, which is called the edge of chaos, because you go from chaos to order. And it is known from the literature that uh, at the edge of chaos, uh, interesting things uh, happen. And there are links to a lot of different areas of dynamical systems and then recurring neural networks stuff regarding this. Um, but so you, 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 if you study C8, you will see that most of the class four CAs that we study are in this, in this region of typical hyperparameter space where the transition happens. And this, is also, this also coincides with a peak in the word entropy, which is telling you that this is where the peak interest, uh, interesting things are happening. And so we, uh, to, to see if we can, uh, can use our model to learn interesting rules, then we uh, decide to configure, this is just a long way to justify hyperparameter choice, by the way. Uh, but so we, we, we chose Kappa to uh, be around the edge of chaos. So the edge of chaos is at 0 0.4. And for obvious reason, we chose uh, 0 0.42 as hyperparameter for the experiment. Um, and so this is, uh, we kind of stay there um, and uh, at that point, you have a GCA, you have your, your graph, you have your states, you have your transition, and you can just generate transitions. Uh, and then you can try to teach your neural network to approximate those transitions in one step dynamics, essentially. And if you do that, it's a no classification problem on your graph. Uh, and you see that in a very few epochs, like 10 or definitely less than 100, um, you get to 100% accuracy in uh, validation, uh, essentially test. Uh, in training and uh, test. Um, and, and this is telling you that your neural network is able to perfectly approximate the rule, which is not that surprising because the rule is very simple. In fact, what I was mentioning before, you can show it that this rule is essentially uh, an XOR problem. And there is the whole explanation in the paper. Uh, and so you kind of need, as, again, as I was saying, you six neurons are enough or eight neurons are enough to solve this problem uh, perfectly, uh, which we do when we actually report the ways uh, to do this in the paper. Uh, but all right, so this was just a first uh, results, first uh, observation they want to do. Another thing that we also measured, which is not important here, it will be important in the next experiment, is that we compared the entropy of the learned system once you let it evolve on its own uh, to the entropy of the system in, uh, of the original system. And so you see that with training, after a while, you essentially approximate the exact uh, entropy values of the original system. Again, not surprising because we have 100% accuracy, the state is binary. So uh, if you're classifying perfectly, then you expect the trajectories to be the same. Where it becomes more interesting is for the second experiment. Um, um, wait, I have a few yeah. questions uh, regarding that. So uh, when you, for, for each uh, iteration of training, do you need to you need to run a full simulation of uh, cellular automata? Like, and how many cellular automata steps you need to run um, before, like, saying this is the loss that, that I have? Right. So in the in these two plots, it's just you you're evaluating on the transition. So you just sample uh, a configuration of cells, you mm -hmm. and then you compare 
the true transition and the transition that you're learning, right? So the GCA and the GNCA, and then you can just compute the loss. So it's okay. it, you don't you don't need to unroll the CA in this case uh, so, to evaluate the entropy. Yes, you do. Okay, so you have a set um, you have a set of transitions, and you just mm -hmm. learn the transition here. You don't simulate the the, the game of life. Uh, exactly. In, in this case, you don't uh, yeah. to, to evaluate the entropy. However, you do because the entropy you evaluate yeah. on the unrolled trajectories. And so, in this kind many, of plot here, uh, uh, yeah, sorry, think, how many steps you need uh, to evaluate the entropy? I do, I don't remember. I think we did a thousand something like that. So you unroll for a thousand steps. I don't really remember the exact value, but a few, like enough to have a precise uh, estimate of the entropy. Okay. All right. Okay, all right, so second experiment, uh, again, similar in principle, uh, it's imitation learning, but then the, this kind of GCA is much more complicated. It's so complicated, in fact, that one of my students started to question of whether it is at all a GCA because, um, or again, what, it does, what does it really mean to be a CA, which was more or less the question that we, we were talking about before. Um, and I, I would make the argument that this is still a kind of solar automata because, uh, this is a, a computer program that is designed to uh, simulate the flocking of birds. And this is called the Boyd's algorithm, was proposed in 1987. Um, and the way this program works is that you have, again, some agents lying on a plane. Each agent has a state, which is its position, uh, coordinates, and velocity on the plane. Uh, and you have a bunch of these. And at every time step, uh, each agent updates uh, its position and velocity according to the position and velocities of its neighbors, where the neighbors are uh, defined according to uh, whatever bird lies in, the, in a given radius from the center. Um, and so again, it is very complex. It is continuous and you, you kind of have this, uh, this model that is far from, way far from the game of life, but the principle is the same. It is entirely driven by local dynamics. So in a sense, uh, however you want to define your CA, uh, the principle of locality is there, and so again, we can see this as a as an interesting playground for our for our approach. And so, uh, similarly, we know the transition rule originally, so we can generate transitions, uh, and we can try to approximate the the true transition with our neural network. Um, and the results are also again uh, very good. Uh, we get to ten to the minus six loss. Uh, this is mean squared error, by the way. Uh, pretty fast, uh, but we don't get to absolute zero loss, which is what we would want, because um, if you have this transition mode and then you let it evolve autonomously, uh, if you don't have zero loss, perfectly zero loss, what will happen is that the trajectories necessarily will diverge from the original ones. So if you start from the same state, even if you have the tiniest bit of loss, the system is so complicated and so chaotic that eventually the trajectories will diverge. In fact, they diverge pretty quickly. Uh, so unless you have a perfect approximation, which it's unrealistic to achieve, uh, you will not uh, be able to exactly replicate the trajectories. But what you can study, and this is where the entropy again comes in, uh, is whether the two systems, so the learned system and the original systems, are behaving in a similar way. And in this case, since the program was designed to simulate flocking, so you can see the formation of these flocks over time, um, you would expect to see the same behavior here. And quantitatively, you can uh, compute some entropy values, which we which call the uh, sample entropy and the correlation dimension, which are two essentially complexity measures uh, for continuous state systems. Um, and you can see that, so the, the line here would be the target and the axis are the values estimated at different points in time uh, with training, so as a function of the epochs. And you see that eventually we get two values that are very close to the real one, which in practice means that if you let the two systems evolve from the same starting condition, they will diverge. But the behavior of the two systems, in this case, I think yellow is the original one and, or, and purple is the other one or vice versa. Um, but you see that the same kinds of flocks happen, the same uh, kind of behaviors at the boundary happen because the original system has a sort of repulsive behavior at the boundary of the simulation box. Uh, and so the GNCA is able to approximate that fairly well. All right, which again, it's just a, a matter of ask, answering the question of, can we use the GNCA to learn 
uh, rules that we already know of, right? And again, the answer is yes or yes fairly well. And so finally, this is the final experiment that we get at, which is not imitation learning, but in a sense, it's rule design. And again, we focus uh, on what has been done in the past in the literature, which is morphogenesis, except we take that and we kind of bring it to the domain of graphs, uh, and in this case of the point clouds. So uh, as before, the task was uh, starting from a random configuration of points and uh, to the, into the flag of Hungary. Um, here again, the, the case is start from a random configuration of points, and you want to morph your, uh, your graph, your, your spatial graph, your, your point cloud mesh into a point cloud that you decide, in this case a bunny, but we tried several. All right, and so this is the task we want to do. We want to morph our point cloud into, into something that we control. Um, but of course, we don't know the rule that does this. In fact, this is what we want to, to find out. Um, and so we have to get smart because we cannot have, we cannot approximate the one-step transitions now. So the way we do this is that we train the GNCA as a sort of recurrent neural network. So what you do is that you start from a given state S, initial state S, you let the model evolve autonomously on its own output for a number of time steps t, which you can sample between, we did between 10 and 20, it's a hyperparameter, of course. Um, and then at some point you will have your final state after t steps, and you just use backpropagation through time with respect to the target state. So you compute the loss with respect to the target state and you use that to update your, your GNCA exactly as a recurrent neural network. I would say a stateless or uh, entirely input-driven uh, recurrent neural network, if you want. Um, and so this is how you can train this. However, this is a, well, a fairly big problem, which is that uh, if you just train your model like this, you will be, uh, you will be forced to choose one T. Uh, so in the number of uh, forward steps that you do during training, and even if you sample it differently at every forward pass, in a sense, you're, you're still kind of limited because what your, what your model will learn uh, is to land at the target in a given number of steps, but there is no guarantee what will happen half afterwards. So in principle, it can diverge and it will diverge in practice. Um, and so to stabilize the training, as I was saying, one thing you can do is that uh, you can sample the T randomly so that you know that, the, let's say between 10 and 20, uh, the model will remain at the target. But what you can also do, which is a trick borrowed uh, from Morbin and colleagues, is that you can use what is called a state's cache or a state's pool which essentially is a memory into which you store the states that you have visited during training. So you just run your GNCA for T steps, wherever you land, you save that into the cache, and then you will reuse that state at some point as initial condition uh, and to, to rerun the GNCA for T steps forward. So this does two things. One thing that it does is that it, in a sense, lets the model explore a bit of the state space. Uh, and the second thing that it does is that uh, at some point, as the model learns, you will have that the output state here is exactly the target state. And so you will take the target state and put it in the cache and then reuse it as initial condition. So in a sense, the model will learn starting from the target state to remain at the target state. And so this is how you actually uh, teach it to be, to be stable, you, you, how you teach it to have these two uh, two modes dynamics that we were discussing before, because uh, the model during training will continuously see uh, some random states, some of the original random states uh, and target states. And starting from all of these different points, it will have to remain at the, it will have to go onto the target. And so this is how you train it. And in practice, if you do this, you train it to go from random to something ordered. And in this case, I'm showing uh, the bunny and the PyGSP logo. You see that it learns to do exactly that. So using this, this smart trick, you can just uh, teach the model uh, in a very few steps. So in let's say 10 or 20 steps, depending on how many you use for training, um, it will land on the target and then it will kind of remain there. As you see from this loss, it goes up to uh, a thousand or, or even more. And, uh, and you see that the model learns a convergent behavior, which is exactly what we want to do. However, this is not the full story, as uh, Hannes was <laughs> also saying before, uh, because sometimes you don't get that. And sometimes you get some very weird different behavior. And what I've shown here is uh, what we call the periodic behavior, where instead of converging, what the model does is that it, it learns to orbit around target point cloud. So in this case, we are showing the evolution of the GNCA 
after training, of course, uh, for a grid. And you see that in the first iterations, you go from initial condition to something that looks like a grid. Then it kind of forgets where it was and it continues changing again until it gets to the grid again. And it does so uh, indefinitely, forever, essentially. And you see that at every, at every orbit around the grid, uh, what it does is that the, the error diminishes, meaning that it's, it's orbiting, in a sense, closer and closer to the grid. Um, and then eventually it's, it, it ends up in a, in a stable orbit and it will remain orbiting around the grid like that. And it does the same for the bunny, except that for the bunny, uh, we see that it does so with a much higher frequency. So for the grid, it does so with a period of 10, which is not surprising because the number of unroll steps during training is also 10. But for the bunny with an unroll, uh, uh, with a T value of 20, it learns a period of two. So the reason for that is unknown. We have tried to study this a bit, but we could not uh, really understand why there is this uh, difference between T and the period and one, when is uh, this periodic behavior happening? But it is really fascinating. And in fact, if you go and Google me up, you can find the uh, animation for these plots on my website. They're, they're really nice to look at. Um, and so this was all in terms of experiment. Sorry, I have a question here. Yeah. Um, so for the periodic behavior, sometimes you observe that the bunny converges and sometimes it oscillates. Mm -hmm. um, did you try many times to see if you can find many different period of oscillation? Like um, my guess would be that any, um, like if you take um, any number that divides 20 because we train on uh, a period of mm -hmm. 20, you, you will be able to find periods of oscillation of four, of five, of 10, and of 20 if you run enough simulation. Uh, yes, the uh, I mean, I tried some experiments in that regard, of course. Uh, so one thing that I would point you to is the fact that this period of two starts, this oscillation of two starts happening fairly early. So even before the 20, and in principle, this behavior should not happen because from initial condition to 20, you would always have uh, a forward pass of 20 steps. So uh, this is this is still kind of weird, um, but yes, there is definitely a relation between the amount of training steps you use during training uh, for the unroll uh, and the oscillation you expect to have. I don't really remember, I should go and look at the paper, but I think that we also observed some oscillations uh, if you sample T randomly at every forward pass. I, I don't really remember, I, I might uh, have to go back and, and check. Um, but but yeah, I mean, there's definitely some sort of things that can be said uh, there for, for how this happens, if not as to why. Uh, but yeah, it's, uh, it's totally an open question for now. Yeah. Um... Just an idea like that. Uh, it would be nice to try to sample random randomly in the set of all prime numbers instead of just sampling a random integer. Just to no. um, to kind of destroy the the fact that like if you sample at ten and then you sample at twenty, well, you can find some kind of oscillation that uh, bounces between yeah. the two. But if you sample only in prime numbers, um, you could kind of regularize that. But um, I, I no, think uh, my personal opinion is that the system is chaotic. So like you can maybe reduce the occurrence of this, but I think uh, just the fact that you have a chaotic system, um, it, it's difficult actually to control the behavior and you don't know what, what could happen and uh, why this happens. Yeah, yeah, it's definitely prone to chaos. And uh, I mean, you try to, to compensate for the chaos. Uh, and in fact, you get you kind of get the stable behavior eventually. And I would say that you get it more often than not. So it's almost always stable. And then sometimes you see this oscillating behavior. Um, but, but yeah, definitely it is something that is, is very tight. Uh, and in fact, if you go and look at what happens, for example, uh, in, in, uh, in the, let's say, image uh, neural cellular automata that they have out there, uh, you kind of see a sort of periodicity, maybe not in time, but you see it in space. So uh, one of the failure modes that uh, these NCA models have is that after reaching the target emoji, it's like the tension breaks and they start painting the emoji all around the place. 
so even outside their training domain and uh and so there is there is definitely i would call it tension or or something that you're kind of constraining this model to do this very um, complicated and 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 the thing with with tight dynamics and uh and then you have this kind of failures that you don't really know how to explain and uh, or at least don't know how to explain clearly but yeah there is definitely a margin for for studying this also um like you, you can see this system as a physical system and you're trying to find the rules there and mm -hmm. one of the big assumptions in physics is the the Occam razor where you state that the simplest solution is the the best one mm -hmm. um, and um in that specific case like have you tried using some regularization like weight decay um such that like here you you find some kind of oscillation periods but maybe by using um a weight decay, the network will be forced into sure. finding a simpler solution that uh, that does not oscillate. Uh, I don't know, like. Uh, sure, if... sure. That's 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 what you would expect, right? I mean, with more regularization, <laughs> you should avoid this kind of, of behavior. Uh, the network is regularized to some degree. Now, I don't really remember the details uh, of the hyperparameters there. They're they're on GitHub. Uh, but uh, but yeah, definitely you you would expect that with uh, weight. In fact. The experiments with the Voronoi tessellation that we did uh, when we tried to uh, learn that GCA with uh, with the eight neurons that I was mentioning before, there you have to regularize it, right? Because otherwise it's difficult for the model to find a solution. In fact, this is this is uh, let's say isomorphic to the to the XOR problem. Uh, and I, I learned something that I didn't know that actually learning to solve the XOR problem is insanely difficult for neural networks. Even if you have the perfect architecture, the minimal architecture, which is like two neurons and an output neuron, uh, even if you have that architecture, it's very, very difficult to find it. You find it like less than 1% of the time when you train a neural network like that. And so you have to regularize it and you have to make a lot of assumptions on the weights and, and stuff like that. But, and so, yeah, there is a lot of, of margin to play with that, uh, with the whole hyperparameter optimization and regularization. Uh, I have a question. Um, can mm -hmm. you hear me? Yeah, sure. Uh, yeah, thanks. Uh, so uh cool work by the way uh, i have uh, like several questions but i just go uh, very quick on um, a few of them uh, uh first of all uh, this uh, uh this work of yours uh, reminds me of uh, this uh, work uh, by uh, deep mind uh, graph neural networks representing uh, physical systems mm -hmm. uh how do you see uh, like uh, the relations between that work because uh, the the backbone of the idea seems similar to me. I mean, not mm -hmm. with the uh, CA, but uh, but with uh, generalized starting from uh, basically an initial condition and ending in basically uh, another uh, desired condition uh, under a certain uh, supervision. It it reminds me of uh, like uh, certain similarity. Sure. Uh, can you can you comment on that? Uh, yeah, so I, I, I am familiar with some of the work that you're mentioning, I, although I don't know the actual implementation details. So uh, from what I understand, there is a lot of similarity in, in this uh, using graph neural networks to, uh, to approximate the one step dynamics, essentially, right? And again, there's a very local system. And, and in fact, you, you would expect that this kind of work should uh, in a sense, map one to one with what they do there. There is also work that uh, also models, for example, this flocking behavior. Uh, although they modeled it for the full trajectory, so they put a, like a, a tighter constraint on that. So th there is a lot of, uh, you know, eventually you're using the same building blocks, it, and it's a graph neural network. So every time you have that, you will have some of the same uh, patterns that emerge. Uh, so so yeah, definitely, it's uh, like physical modeling is one of the things we're actually looking into right now. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's uh, definitely a parallelism that exists. Uh, I guess, uh, yeah, sorry to, to add to that, like, uh, there have been some work, uh, especially I think Stephen Wolfram is working a lot of, on that aspect, but about mm -hmm. uh, trying to simulate the physical laws using a uh, game of life, um, mm -hmm. and using a cellular automata, not uh, yeah. the game of life. Typically. So there's a, there's a big relation and there's a, a mathematical movement, although it's quite small, but there's a mathematical movement about really like trying to bring the cellular automata to simulate uh, every complex system. Yeah, no, uh, I'm sorry, my, my earphones just died, so I will try.
<laughs> hope you can still uh, hear me hear me fine um, so, uh, so so yeah definitely the cellular automata as I was saying before they are they're a very natural computational model. So I remember, for example, in the it was the first year of university, one of my professors was uh, working on simulating the flow of water through uh, coffee coffee grounds, uh, and you can model that as as a cellular automata because it's it's everything is happening locally in physics, and so uh, yeah, physical modeling is one such such process where you have where you have that strong locality and and the physics is shared between every particle. so that's that's the same setting. I hope you can still hear me. Um, I was I was wondering if I could add in there and then also ask a, a question, a follow-on question. Yeah, um, sure, that's right. Um so I guess there's the the comment I would have with cellular automata is often the um, because there's a Monte Carlo step associated it with the, the energy calculation it's very hard to associate it with the physical system and yet it's very good and i think we all agree that cellular automata especially the game of life is incredible for the richness of the patterns that can be created with very simple rules mm -hmm. um as i understand your work here maybe i've misunderstood it but you've made uh, a higher par parameter approximation of the low level system so by using the graph neural networks you've essentially a you're able to learn the transition uh, rule, but with a much higher parameter, with, sure. with much larger number of parameters. I wonder, especially with this interesting periodic behavior you're showing here, have you done any work in looking at the um, the coefficients, the, the correlation between these weights? So here, for example, with the different periodic, periodic behavior, is there similar parameters um, that are being, similar weights that are being uh, displayed when there's periodic behavior compared to when there's non-periodic behavior? Are you able to kind of isolate the aspects of the network in which lead to this periodicity or, or maybe you haven't done that analysis? I, I haven't. I haven't done that. And it's uh, actually actually a great, uh, great uh, idea. So yeah, it's, uh, it's definitely something you would want to check. Uh, so the actual weights and, and this kind of, uh, so I, I had a whole uh, thing of going forward with this, uh, but this kind of ties to one of the applications that I see this uh, useful for, uh, which is, uh, approximating a system that you see like a natural system and then in a sense looking at what rule has the model learned uh to try and understand the system right so you you, you kind of go do it in a data-driven way uh, for a system that has this sort of uh, local interaction applied over time uh, and then you try and look at what the weights are telling you for that particular system, right? Uh, and try and interpreting that, or or then if maybe running some some sort of uh, what if analysis. Um, and so yeah, it's definitely something you would you would want to do uh, studying this uh, this approach for it forward. There's there's some work done by Miles Cranmer, which you might have seen, where he uses um, uh, ev artificial evolution and neural sim symbolic representation, and essentially is then able to take yeah. this neural network and derive the equations. Maybe interesting. Yeah, that's that's actually something I was thinking about. Uh, it's uh, it's probably something that would yield very interesting results, and uh, we have a few applications that we are working on uh, with some collaborators that are actually going in that in that direction. Yeah, that's good. Great work. Can I ask a quick question? Yeah, sure. Yeah, uh, first of all, uh, it's a really great work. Uh, I'm assuming that uh, all these are the generative uh, modeling, which is based on graph neural networks, as well as uh, in the cellular automata, right? And I'm sorry, can you repeat the question? Uh, like, uh, these are all the generative modeling, which is actually based on the graph neural networks, as well as cellular automata as a mm -hmm. combination or a blend, right? Yeah, sure. and uh, yeah, and in generative modeling, I was also like researching these days, like uh, about the different other generative architectures from autoencoders to the GANs, and uh, in there was an art architecture of generating small and complex molecules, uh, which is actually uh, a combination of GANs and uh, reinforcement learning, mm -hmm. and as you have mentioned here also, like uh, these systems are really very much chaotic uh, to get into one stabilization point. So uh, why not uh, just use uh, kind of in deep reinforcement learnings in order to just get the optimal pathway of stability, uh, like uh, in instead of doing uh, different kinds of hyperparameter tuning in order to learn a general sure. path. So uh, there, there are two uh, short and, and not satisfying questions to, your, to the answer to your question. Uh, the first would be that the, 
it's definitely possible, but we didn't explore it yet. Uh, so it's definitely one thing that you would want to do. Uh, I have to say, I, and at the risk of, I, I don't know, uh, making people, some people angry, but I, I have worked with reinforcement learning in the past and I don't see it as a more stable alternative to uh, typical, uh, I would say, let's say supervised or, or classical machine learning. Uh, yes, it gives you the ability to, to learn through non-differentiable uh, targets, of course, uh, but it's not necessarily that using reinforcement learning, you sidestep the problems you have here. Um, so that would probably need to be observed in, in practice. I, I think it's difficult to make the claim a priori, but uh, but definitely if you have some sort of behavior that you can only specify through that framework of the reward function, uh, then then by all means, this is just this is just a tool, right? This is just telling you, okay. And again, maybe the the whole point uh, of this paper. Uh, that I think it's important is uh, is just uh, uh, proposing a, a kind of mentality where you instead of having many layers uh, all different and then you just apply them a few times and then it ends there to do like classification for instance you have the same layer the same model applied many times over time like a recurring neural network which is not something that uh, I've seen a lot doing uh, with with graphs so far. I mean, it was done a lot in the past. There are words that do this, of course, uh, but uh, but always in, in in a kind of different way and not thinking about letting the model evolve and, and seeing what what it does in the meantime. So uh, I think that it's it's good to think of different possibilities while keeping this this new no not new but this this paradigm uh, in mind. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. So maybe if there aren't uh, any more questions for now, I'll just uh, super briefly, because I'm, I'm, I think I'm out of time, uh, super briefly go to uh, some of the things that I think we can do with this. Um, as I was saying before, uh, this idea of repeating the computation over time until it converges, for instance, was already explored in 2004, five or four, or even 97 maybe, uh, where uh, the, the whole idea of graph representation learning was let the graph neural network converge to something to a fixed point and that fixed point is my representation so that was already embedded into the idea of the gnn in the seminal paper of gnn by, by marco gori of course um, and that you can still use today uh, and you can still use this approach to compute some graph classification for some, some some graph representation for you although i would argue that this is not what you would want to use this model for um there are a few things that i think are more interesting also going forward one would be of course uh control and but yet the centralized control mean that you can imagine a system of agents where everything is everybody is doing the same thing in the distributed network and reacting to the to the um, to the neighbors essentially to, to the environment that it sees with the neighbors and you can think of application of this uh, I think for like for example in the in the self driving car uh, problem where you have cars that necessarily need to act uh, locally need to act in a decentralized manner and maybe you can envision some sort of high level objective that this local interaction must yield for instance you know uh, act locally because that's what you that's what your sensors are telling you but also act in a way that avoids traffic uh, globally right uh, and so that would be one possible application or at least one way of thinking at the problem um and then as i was saying this idea of uh, using the gnca as a tool to uh, study uh, and understand natural phenomena and of course epidemiological networks are one big uh, one big application of this we're actually doing some work with the university of padova in this regard where you can um well essentially you can imagine that the diffusion of a virus uh, is in a sense a phenomenon that happens locally and then you kind of see some global trends emerge and so you can also uh, try and, and appro approximate that with, uh, with I the have a quick question yeah uh, regarding so this is something I, uh, I I put in the in the chat earlier um oh sorry I completely missed that yeah oh no 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 it wasn't it wasn't like directed towards you it was, it was just like a general question for the chat to see what other people were thinking but it was in terms of like locality so I've been working with uh, neural cellular automata for many, many months now, <laughs> inspired sure. by Alex's uh, Distill publication. I'm coming from more of the computer vision side of things, uh, creative AI, et cetera. Um, and um, one of the, the, the difficulties I've faced is with trying to convince like my colleagues, supervisors, 
uh, about the benefits of, of NCAs. And so I had to come up with like a very concise and strong definition of what constitutes an, a neural cellular automata. And one mm -hmm. aspect of this definition that's been bothering me is the notion of locality and <laughs> trying to understand, well, what the heck does locality mean? Like locality is very subjective. It can be global. Yeah. Right? Like, so I, I, I linked a paper uh that was uh that had an open review associated with it which you might you might know uh called learning to generate 3d shapes with generative cellular automata it's the one with like the minecraft is that the one in minecraft yes i was gonna say that's super and alex, nice yeah and, like, alex like uh commented on that and was talking about like the the how they used uh how each cell basically was able to perceive like every other cell and he was commenting on how like in relation to his growing uh, CA work, mm -hmm. that, they, that they took a really purist perspective in terms yeah. of like reality and that it was very much like a three by three immediate uh, neighbors kind of neighborhood. But then he also admitted that like, you know, this is also technically a, a cellular automata. And, and I was just like, yeah. So, you know, if you, <laughs> if, if locality could be just like your entire global neighborhood, then that means like diffusion can just be short circuited. Like you can just skip the diffusion of information because you can just like yeah. say, hey, my like the information I have is all the way there and I can see it. So I'll just copy it over here. Yeah. And that, that part annoys me because I'm just like, damn it. Like, does this have to be yet another hyperparameter that I have to play with? Like, I, yeah, I, I, I agree. Like how, how information uh, <laughs> in body across cells using like hormones and whatnot and how that. And, and I'm like, well, how far do hormones go? Like, where, where, where yeah. does it stop? Like, yeah. I'll just so, wonder, like, what your, you know, take on that is. Yeah, so far from me, uh, from, from contradicting Alex Morvinsev on this topic, uh, but I think that if you are stretching your definition of CA so that, let's say, your every cell has a global view of the, of the environment, then you're... Yeah, no, maybe it fits the definition, but it's not really, I would yeah. say, in the spirit of the thing, right? Yeah. Yeah. So with, with that in mind, uh, I would say that the locality is given entirely by the neighborhood function. So you, you define that, right? Uh, so whatever that means for you, it can be spatial, it can be functional, it can be, you know, any kind of logical relation between... Uh, between the nodes, but once you have, you know, you agree as to what that means, uh, then you, you can have that as a given that you don't touch that anymore, right? You, you know that uh, the, the evolution of, of your cell will depend only on these uh, subset of the, of the environment. And, and that's, that's all, right? That's, that's the starting condition. And, and on top of that, you, then you build and you complicate things. And of course, you, you, you get to continuous and, you know, whatever. Um, but, but so that's, that's would be, that would be my definition of locality. And, and there's also, um, I think it was Dominic, or, or maybe I, I had this discussion uh, with somebody at, at the New Europe's poster for this, for this paper, uh, where they were saying, okay, but so you have uh, your, your edge attributes to identify the neighbors, right? And so in principle, what you can do is that you can have uh, a unique edge attribute for every node. Right or for, for every edge essentially, um, and so you can do you know insanely complicated things because because you can specialize your transition rule for every uh, for every edge. But again, this kind of violates the spirit of the thing. So you know you don't have a unique edge attribute for every edge because that's not local anymore. That's a form of global let's say signal or supervision that you're given. Right, um, and so again, what you would expect is that as you have in the grid where you have up and down and left and right, so categorical kinds of relations between the nodes. Uh, here too, you, you have a finite set of possible directions or, or attributes that you have, uh, or, or at least some, uh, some attributes that are uh, have the same meaning in every neighborhood, right? And, and, and if you have all of this, uh, then you can say that you are truly local and you are truly interacting locally. And I think a, a good, exercise you can do is that you can try and, and come up with uh, systems where that locality is forced. And so, for instance, virus transmission, there is necessarily there is no global signal in a virus transmission. It's necessarily something that happens locally, right? You, you, you can't just decide that because somebody is sick in China now or, or, uh, or in America, then some other node in Europe automatically get 
infected, right? Because it's not a local interaction. And so, uh, you know, if you, if you start thinking in, term, in these terms, I think you can get a pretty good sense of uh, what can fall under this framework. I hope that was a satisfying answer. I'm not sure. Though. Yeah, I yeah, know, definitely. That, that, that helps, that helps <laughs> me. I mean, I, I joined this so I can see other people working in, in the field, like what their perspectives are on, uh, on this. Because yeah. it still seems to be, you know, a, a somewhat emerging field, the neural aspect of cellular automata. I know C yeah. work is quite old. Um, but yeah, thank you. Yeah, sure. Yeah, no uh, I, I would Sorry, like I to you. add uh, to your comment uh, on this uh, about locality. Uh, uh, but something that I'm also working uh, on uh, is uh, so not uh, all interactions uh, are actually pairwise. So, in a sense of local, uh, you could say that uh, I go for pairwise interaction with the nearest neighbor. Uh, and uh, as you said, uh, for example, two nodes on uh, uh, basically you, from very far Euclidean distance could not be interacting. Uh, but um, I mean that that's uh, that's true. But at the same time, uh, the the finite number of uh, uh, pairwise interactions could be uh, not uh, all of the interactions uh, of this interaction set. It could be also. Uh, that one could uh, have uh, basically higher order interactions, for example, uh, within the uh, simplex uh, of the of the nodes, uh, you could have basically um, what is called this topological interactions, mm -hmm. which uh, takes into account more than uh, basically pairwise interactions. So in, mm -hmm. instead of ha if having one chain, you can have like two chains and like n chains between between the nodes, and then. Uh, then uh, you look at uh, not at the edge attribute, but at the surface attribute, for example, in the one sh simple shell uh, case, or uh, basically, if you go higher, you, you have volume, not surface volume, and, and so on. So mm -hmm. yeah, that's, that's also something, uh, uh, yeah, in, in complex systems, uh, this higher order interactions actually are the, uh, are the building blocks of the emergent phenomena. So yeah. Right. And, and I think that the extreme version of that would be that you have arbitrary n tuples as edges uh, where n can vary. So you have the, the hypergraph in general, right? Or I yeah, guess exactly. in, the, uh, exactly. in the implementation that Alex has, you can just have like a three by three convolution as, as a second step, as opposed to just in the first stage for uh, sure. setup. Then you can just have like higher order, you know, semantics be built upon through just three by three convolutions as the receptive field goes larger. Absolutely, and and you can do the same here, right? Because this is message passing, so uh, you know, yeah, minor yeah. Uh, isomorphism uh, problems and WL problems, but uh, you you can stack uh, several message passing steps, or you can just increase the size of the of the neighborhood, you know, to account for K hop. Hopefully, not not till it like goes global. <laughs> Yeah, ex exactly. I mean, uh, but but at some point, I mean, just by applying, even just by applying the same rule over and over over time, it will go global at some point. I mean, it, you will rip from the whole okay. network, and that's that's probably what you want, right? You want to be able to coordinate, uh, because otherwise, every node is just you yeah. Know, blind so, locality is not important on its own. You have to have yeah. interaction at some point. Yeah, yeah. I, yeah. I like to add also that. Um, the, depending on the system that you would like to simulate, you'll have to change the complexity of your system. Uh, for example, when, when we look at atomic interactions, atomic interaction mostly happen locally, like the strongest forces, the nuclear forces and the molecular bonds happen at a very, very close distance. Mm -hmm. But then if you take other forces like the electric interaction and even a weaker force like gravity, like if you're trying to simulate um, the universe from the simplest rule and you only look at the local neighbors, well, you might be able to simulate the quantum mechanics, uh, the molecular dynamics very, mm -hmm. very precisely. But will you ever be able to simulate gravity, which yep. only happens when you have huge systems that interact uh, with a very long distance? And the answer is like, um, no, or like not in a straightforward way, like maybe in a very, very more complex simulation. Uh, so you will, you need, depending on the system that you're trying to simulate, you need to modify um, what, what you have and you could have a global information 
uh, here a global interaction that is dependent on one divided by the square distance. If you're sure. trying to mimic electrical or gravitational interactions. Sure. If you're trying to, to mimic human behaviors or virus behaviors or things like that, that depend on the past because they have some kind of information, then maybe mm -hmm. even adding an RNN to a node itself uh, as a memory of the past interaction and not just uh, not just directly interacting with the current environment, but also having a memory of the past interaction. Now the question is when you add these memories and this global interaction, is it still cellular automata? Right. And, yeah. I so mean, isn't the memory already there though? That's kind of the whole point of like the hidden states in a cellular automata. It's the hidden state in each cell is technically equivalent to like the hidden state that you would find in an RNN. As a matter of fact, I, like it's pretty straightforward to like just use an RNN in a cellular automata <laughs> that way. Yeah. I, I I don't know about that formally, uh, but definitely I think that you can encode memory into these systems. I I mean, I have colleagues that are much uh, better than me at doing this kind of stuff. Uh, but, you know, the notion of memory is something you can study formally. Um, and it really depends on the systems you're trying to approximate. Uh, I would say the, the, some of these models are too incomplete. Uh, and so I would say that there is a way of encoding you know some sort of global memory into the system right uh and so maybe maybe not that say at the single cell level but you definitely can take uh past states or past configurations into account as you uh as you let these models evolve but but definitely i agree with the general principle that dominic was discussing which is uh you you definitely need to uh, in a sense fine tune your model to the problem and this is nothing nothing new actually it is uh, i would say it is one of the most important design principles we have in machine learning um because of course if your goal is to just you know propose a, a general tool like this one of course you will use the same model everywhere but uh if you want to actually solve the problem then you need to to, to make it custom for your problem. And, and for instance, I, I was discussing this with um, a neuroscientist in, the, in, in DeepMind um, and, uh, and what they were doing, they, they commented on the fact that, and this is related to this uh, modeling biological systems point, right? I was saying, okay, the neurons uh, and the, the neurons in the brain are kind of system that acts uh, strictly locally. And so you can probably model this like this. And, and, and they said, no, uh, you, you know, you have hormones, you have chemical signals. And so you can probably uh, merge the two behaviors because, because yes, you have a local interactions and, and yes, the firing of a neuron is strongly dependent on, on what it's reading from the neighbors. Uh, but at the same time, you also have this global behavior. So you can probably model that and, and nothing is forbidding you to do this, right? And so if the task is to actually solve some problem, then you would want to model the, you, you, you know, model the real system as close as possible. Yeah, so uh, when you say that the system is too incomplete, um, it means that like you can simulate anything. The question is what you want to simulate at the node, uh, at the individual uh, node level. Like if sure. you're trying that every node simulates a human you need to make the system the individual node more complicated uh, but mm -hmm. otherwise the system being turing complete means that you can have like a huge region that would have memory without explicitly implementing memory yeah and that would that huge blob would simulate a human but then you will need you will need a, a huge amount of compute and you will need to really define like um what's your system so it's uh, it's always about like how you modify your cellular automata to represent the system that you want. Yeah, uh, you're, you're correct. You're, you're totally correct. I agree. Yeah, that, that, that claim, that, that comment about doing computers was just me trying to grasp at straws and, and trying to make sense of the concept of memory. But but definitely, you, you are correct. This uh, the Turing computers was this that tells you nothing about the memory of a single cell. Uh, but but I guess that you can possibly uh, make the claim that you know, by introducing an extra state or, or whatever, uh, you can introduce memory even at the cell level. That I mean, was that's, my, that's kind of what I understood, though, for the hidden channels in uh, at least Alex's implementation, uh, where they have, you know, the, the channels that are explicitly used for computing the loss, so like the mm -hmm. RGB channels. 
Um, and, but then you also have hidden channels that aren't mm -hmm. used us, and those hidden channels are just used to facilitate intercell communication. And those hidden channels can be uh, treated as basically like a memory stream, right? Like sure. those hidden channels can you can easily equate that to what I was saying before is like the 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 hidden state used in uh, an LSTM, for example. As yeah. Matter, you know, you can you can like replace the update rule with a gated recurrent unit, which I've I've tried, and it's mm -hmm. you know it, it comes comes to a, like a fairly similar uh, description of a net neural cellular automata. You just change the update rule, so you sure, still sure. you know the hidden state now is 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 stored as as part of each cell. Yeah, I mean you can probably make the argument that this the cellular automata state is uh, the the hidden state of or or the you know this state of the recurrent neural network because this is in in effect, is a recurring neural network, and you train it as such with that propagation through time. So, so yeah, you can you can say that it's that's your your state, and it it works. So, so yeah, definitely. I I, I just I just don't want to make any uh, formal thing regarding this uh, because I haven't worked on this, but uh, it makes sense. So I think we have like fifteen uh, comments. Uh, in the chat. Yeah, I don't know if there were any questions. Oh, and sorry, my, my camera apparently froze. But the, yeah, the, there's, for example, the question about uh, whether the, uh, the bunny that you create, like, did you train on the same bunny or as you evaluate? But I think mm -hmm. that's uh, missing a bit the, the point, but if you want to, to elaborate on it, then um, go ahead. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. So the, I get asked that question a lot because it's, it's kind of <laughs> in antithesis with what we typically do in machine learning. Uh, but, but yes, you are 100% overfitting on the single bunny here. Um, and and you kind of want to do that. Uh, and it's you're allowed, in a sense, to do that because what you're really interested in knowing is that is whether there exists, even if there exists a rule that actually gets you from random point to bunny. And, and so you're looking for that one specific rule for that one specific configuration of point cloud. Uh, so now the most more interesting approach uh, or, or thing to study would be, uh, can we somehow teach uh, the same neural network the same weight to land on different uh, configurations. And I think that Alex Morvins has already done some work in that regard. Uh, you can link a paper to it. <laughs> yeah. And, okay. and, and also, I think one, one thing that I'm sure that they did was that they um, they trained um, a, a neural cellular automata for images to essentially color in the MNIST digits uh, depending on the class. So, for instance, it, they would train it to color the, you know, all sevens uh, in red and all twos in in green, uh, and and then you change, you know, you change up the the number, and the system kind of autonomously evolves towards the correct color, um, and so that was really cool, and uh, and that you and then you can kind of look at that whole uh, thing if you want, but for for this paper and and also for the original NCA paper is just uh, one target, uh, one rule, you just overfit the hell out of that, uh, that, that target. And it's hard enough already like that. I just linked a variational neural cellular automata, which I think got rejected at iClear, but still is pretty interesting. They try to go like the generative approach. Yeah. But like, I just think it's, yeah. Neural cellular, neural cellular automata are super cool because you can have this, especially this thing with the perturbations where they always get back into some stable state. Yeah. But then for modeling, modeling dynamics of a system or like for the, the flocking behavior maybe, or if we want to model some fluid dynamics or some atoms, then I just think why why would we put this into this specific framework of uh, cellular automata? Like it's a general right. thing and we, we have, um, we just take a graph neural network. And, and sure, yeah, I mean, you, you can drop the name if you if you want, like the, the, the name is is the less least important thing of this. Like you are totally correct at some point, And even when I was writing this paper, it 
the, the question kind of begged itself of, uh, okay, like what, like the seller automata is like the game of life. So what the hell is this compared to the game of life? And then why do you need to call it like that? Uh, and, and this like ties back to the discussion on locality. So if you, if you want, uh, you know, again, remove the, the seller automata name, it's, it's a system where the interactions are happening strongly locally and uh, and over time, and that's it, that's all. Uh, and so if you don't like to call that a seller automata, because I realize it's, it's stretching it a bit, you want to say it's a, it's a sort of dynamical system, it, it maybe it becomes continuous over time, and, and there is like this this gradient that that takes you from from the game of life to fluid dynamics, right? Uh, where you know the time becomes uh, continuous and then the state becomes continuous, and uh, and maybe even the geometry at some point becomes continuous. Um, and and all of that is, is in this gradient, and at some point you need to, to draw this line, uh, and maybe at some point you stop calling it cellular automata because it doesn't make sense anymore. Uh, but the principle remains, and so again most of the tools I expect would transfer to this new application of the uh, of a very simple modeling of fluid dynamics. Okay. Yeah, yeah, I think yeah. I, I think it's important to like really uh, emphasize the like I guess the the parts that make up the whole as opposed to just focusing on the name cellular automata. Like mm -hmm. you know, it's distributive, it's decentralized, you know, local interactions resulting in uh, global like self-organization mm -hmm. uh, each cell like can be what a cell could be whatever you want it to be like a cell could be a, a neural network for example right yeah. like you can think of a cell as a gpu on on a, on a network and having a decentralized sharing of weights or whatever like th that's the part that i think i like a lot and so this kind of self-organization can result in like robust uh and uh, persistive behavior um, yeah sometimes regenerative based on, I guess, how you trained it. <laughs> and yeah. so this is, this is like, for me, is like what I, I like breaking it into. Yeah, I agree. And, and I would also probably have to admit that me sticking to the cellular automata idea uh, throughout this paper is uh, probably my own affection towards this, this models. This is what really got me excited, like for the first time in computer science at all when I was a student, a uh, young student many years ago. Um, and, uh, and so it, I always kind of wanted to work in this, in this subject and, uh, and, and then you can start, uh, you know, you, you complicate things. And I guess I, I got too tied to where I started from, uh, even when it became maybe more than that uh, at some point, but uh, as we were saying, it's, uh, it's really not important. It's, it's the principle that counts, yeah. Yeah, but it's definitely understandable that you were drawn to this to this subject and this area. And yeah, I guess we're lucky that you were and we got <laughs> a nice paper out of it. Yeah. And so also I have I have details for the papers. If if anybody is um, interested, there is the code, which uh, it's unfortunately uh, in. I mean, unfortunately, it's for many people, unfortunately, it's in TensorFlow. Uh, but we're working on the PyTorch version uh, because I'm I'm starting to switch towards PyTorch. So uh, eventually it will come out. Uh, but you can you know uh, I, I like to say that they're basically one to one mappable the two frameworks. So you can. You can go and read out uh, how you would implement this, and um, and yeah, you know, and also like feel free uh, to reach out uh, anytime if you have questions or want to to argue about things. Okay, then I guess that's a a nice some nice finishing words, and yeah, don't forget to follow Rice as fight on. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, but then thank you so much for the the great paper and the nice presentation. And also, yeah. thanks to Matti, Namit, uh, Hossein for the active participation and the nice, yeah, nice comments. It's super interesting. Yeah, like, great. I, I have nothing to say about uh, cellular automata, kind of. Uh, so it's super cool to uh, to have you here as well. And Dominique, thanks for uh, co-hosting. Yeah, and thank you for having me, of course. And uh, this is a very, very great initiative you guys are doing. And uh, I think it's really it's really important to have this in the community. So uh, great work and, and, and thank you for having me on. While I was a bit skeptical about graph cellular automata in the beginning, Daniele obviously convinced me that they're a super interesting topic. And if you want to learn about more super interesting topics like this, 
make sure that you follow our social media or join our uh, mailing list or our Slack channel to get updates about the, the upcoming papers.